Hello and welcome back to the Slightly Fox podcast, brought to you this time not from Hoxton Square as usual, but London, Dartmoor and Cambridge. My name is Philippa Lamb and I'm the one in Cambridge. Joining me remotely from Highbury in North London, I have Slightly Fox editor Hazel Wood. Hello, Hazel. Hello. And in Devon, Gail Perkis. Hello. Now, I've been enjoying your editor's diary emails, you two, during lockdown. A very intriguing window into your lives right now. Yes, it's been an odd experience, and I, I rather fear we've made a rod for our own backs because, um, to begin with, there was quite a lot to say. But we're both a bit worried that if we have to carry on into the winter, where I mean, absolutely nothing happens up on Dartmoor in the winter, <laughs> we're shrouded in mist, it pours with rain. But fortunately, at the moment, I've been having a lot of hijinks with cattle escaping and um, sheep being shorn and, you know, country life. Yeah, I'm, I'm very envious. There's none of that in Cambridge. In Highbury, you've been, you've been busy in Highbury, Hazel. Well, yes, we've been busy. I do have the sense of the world getting, in a way, sort of smaller and smaller. But it's very interesting because, of course, you are really thrown back on your resources. It's made me look at books that I, I haven't looked at for a long time. I've got acquainted with the garden and, indeed, the neighbourhood. You know, so it, it's been actually a very fascinating experience. It's made me feel a little bit like a sort of Jane Austen person, you know, with this very small compass. Yes. But as Gail said... We feel we might have made a bit of a rod for our own backs. <laughs> the last one I saw from you, Hazel, was so funny. It was trials and tribulations of, of grappling with all the kit for remote recording the podcast. Oh, dear. Yes. As I said, I think in the newsletter, it's, it's no secret that Gail and I are not entirely at home in this technical world. Being confronted with these parcels of equipment, you know, I had to take a deep breath and unpack it and... I was astonished at how easy it initially seemed, but then there was a terrible hiccup. <laughs> However, yes, I feel I've learned something. <laughs> You've done sterling. Well, I should explain to the listeners that Lynn and I, who produced the podcast, we sent out microphones to Gail and Hazel and, and endless cables and instructions on, on how to use recording platforms. And they have done sterling work in getting to grips with it all. There are likely to be some noises off um, during this podcast, but they may be rather different noises, I suspect, than normal. I think it'll be rather more bucolic sounds from Gail's end. Oh, well, possibly the, sh the sheep are actually um, right down in the bottom field at the moment, but if the postman turns up, then I'm afraid um, Chudley and Stanley will be off. <laughs> <laughs> so bear, bear with us, everyone, if you would. Obviously, as you can hear, we're all working from home like millions of other people in the UK right now, but um, the publishing schedule it waits for no one, Gail. Yes, that's right. We um, have been incredibly fortunate, actually, with our printers. Uh, we sent off the summer issue to be printed at the end of March, and they have been working right through lockdown. The books and the new issue arrived in the office last week, and Hattie walked nine miles into the office. Anna walked over four miles in. Jess got her husband to drive her in. And they took delivery of issue 66 and the new Slightly Fox edition, The Empress of Ireland. Also a plain Fox edition of The Past is Myself. And they carried them all the way up the stairs on the hottest day of the year so far. The team at Slightly Fox is amazing, isn't oh, it? Oh, they I go mean, above they, and they beyond. Really, they really they do. do. Yes, they've been absolutely sterling, I must say. And of course, Gail and I do an awful lot of our work from home anyway. So we've been able to carry on sort of almost as normal, reading submissions, editing copy, deciding what goes into each issue. I've got a strong sense we're going to have trouble getting you two back into the office, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I am looking forward to just getting properly out of the house. We had a Zoom tea party last week, so we had all seven of us. And... Um, it was hilarious to see each other after so long. Of course, all our hair has grown. The hair um, issue. <laughs> yes, and of course, there is a now a new addition. There's the first fox cub, because Jenny had a baby. Jenny's and, little girl, yes. And um, an extra person appeared on the screen. It's lovely. Life continues regardless, doesn't it? And that brings us, of course, neatly to this month's podcast. It's just the three of us this time, uh, and it's all about the magazine and the people who write all the pieces for it. Who are they? How do they find their way to Slightly Foxed? And how do they decide which books to write about? We'll have book recommendations as usual at the end. Well, Slightly Fox writers are a very mixed bunch. I mean, some of them are household names. Others have literally never published so much as an article, let alone a book, before their work appears in Slightly Foxed. Yes. At the very beginning, we decided that... Um 
slightly foxed USP, if it had one, would be that it was not going to be written by necessarily professional journalists and writers. We wanted to have people from all sorts of backgrounds with all sorts of different life experiences because very often the people who are doing something else are equally good writers. So we've always had a mixed bunch. We started off with people that we personally knew who we thought Uh would be willing to write for us. And gradually, gradually over the years, that's extended and expanded. And we do have a great mixture of people whose names you might know and people you've never heard of, um, including a number of our subscribers who've turned out to be very good writers. I mean, in the summer issue, for example, we've got Margaret Drabble writing about the water babies. Yeah, so Margaret Drabble, she was on a podcast um, only a couple of months ago for us, wasn't she? I think it was March. But her husband writes for you as well, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Michael Holroyd. Yes, and we've also reissued his own memoir. Puzzle Street Blues. Yes. So Margaret Drabble, of course, is very well known, but some of our writers are much less well known. Yes, we've got another piece in the summer issue by a man called Andrew Joins, who we've never met. And he, I think he's retired now, but he was a current affairs producer for the BBC. And he sent in unsolicited a piece on Kipling's Captain's Courageous several years ago, which was wonderfully done and, and pitch perfect. And now in the summer issue, he's written another piece on a book by T.H. White, um, of course, T.H. White is, you know, best known for The Once Future King. A wonderful and book. Also, yeah. Yes, and The Goshawk, which, of course, inspired Helen MacDonald's memoir, H is for Hawk. But he's not writing about either of those. He's writing about England Have My Bones, which is a sort of diary that T.H. Uh, White kept in a year when he was debating whether or not to give up his day job teaching at Stowe. He was a very troubled man. and This was in the 30s, is that right? In the 30s, yes. yes. So he spent a year um, rough shooting, fishing, hunting in the winter, but he also decided to embark on a series of flying lessons. One of the national papers had offered a prize for the person who could learn to fly within a year and compete in a, in a race. And so T.H. White took flying lessons, <laughs> uh, of course, in a, in a tiger moth. And there are some wonderful descriptions of him flying over southern England, and particularly over Sussex, which is where Andrew Joins now lives. And we were lucky to get the artist Martin Yeoman to do a lovely little sketch of a tiger moth. Um, but it felt like a very summary piece. Then in the same issue, we've got a, a piece by Sarah Crowden, who's um, she's not really a writer, she's an actor. And she first came to us some years ago with a very funny article about a collection of books that she's been gathering for years. And they're all unintentionally smutty titles. So, L- like for example, what? like Roger <laughs> the Missionary, <laughs> for example. <laughs> So she wrote that piece and through that we obviously we got to know her and she's since become a regular contributor and she's written about Penelope Chetwood's journey through Spain on horseback um, through Andalusia. She of course was uh, the wife of John Betjeman and Sarah I think identifies with her. They're both sort of doughty figures, you know, real troopers. And not only does she write for us but she's brought us jars of chutney. She and her husband have a couple of allotments and they're very keen gardeners. As with quite a lot of other contributors, they've become almost part of the family. She's even done a bit of envelope stuffing for you, hasn't she? She's done a lot of envelope stuffing, yes. Of course, regaling us with hilarious stories about actors and actresses in the West End. She's very Theatrical gossip. Yes, absolutely. And your writing competitions over the years, they've produced some new writers for you, haven't they? (laughs) Yes, we've had um, several of them. The first couple that we did were open to anybody. We got... A lot of submissions in. I have to say that quite a lot of them were unusable. But there were some gems in amongst them, in particular a a librarian who lives in near Toronto called Ken Haig, who's written some lovely articles for us. And somebody down in Devon, Posey Fallowfield, who has become a, a regular. And we also did one competition for young writers and we published an article by a girl who I think was in the midst of university living in the Midwest. It was a charming article but it was very telling with the young writers that on the whole people writing about books, age and experience and wisdom do tell. 
So after that competition, we decided to do one for people over the age of 60. All right. They were so successful, that one, that we got four new writers out of it. None of them were actually professional writers. Sometimes, though, we do get a, a really lovely piece. I think Alistair Glegg was, was one of them, wasn't he? Yes, yes, he um, was. Who wrote about his school teachers and how they kind of just instilled a love of poetry and reading in him as a child and it was just such a very sort of charming piece it just needed nothing doing to it at all it came in perfect so we've done well out of the competition really yeah but even even without a competition we still get at least 10 to 15 submissions a month and of course during lockdown quite a lot of people have come out of the woodwork who'd promised pieces a long time ago and suddenly of course they've now got time to do it so we've got a very long list of articles to read and indeed articles banked up for the future. I think we've been busier during lockdown really than we we are normally. So I'm intrigued by this process Hazel. People bring ideas of books they want to write about to you. I mean does it matter to you if the books they choose are actually worth reading? Well, the point is really that they have to make a good case for them. They have to convince you that they're worth reading. There are undoubtedly books that I'm never going to open. For example, we had a delightful piece on a book called Inside of a Dog. Inside of a Dog? Inside of a Dog, yes, which was about how to read a dog in a way. Charmingly written. I'm not a dog lover. I mean, I'm a cat person, I have to admit. I would never be reading a book called Inside of a Dog, but I found the piece delightful. We, we don't expect people who read Slightly Fox to want to read all the books, but if you find one or two books that you like, then that's fine with us. I mean, we've had an article on Terry Pratchett's Discworld books, which I, I wouldn't read in a million years. But millions of people obviously but think Millions fabulous, of people do. We've got another article coming later on on the short stories of Ray Bradbury. And again, I don't think he's somebody who would ever particularly appeal to me. But that's no reason you know, not to have a, a very well-written article about him. Yes, because there's always the danger of echo chamber otherwise, isn't there? Yes, just, exactly. Just having stuff exactly. about that you would personally enjoy yourself. And, and I mean, aim, all, no, I was just going to say our aim is to make Slightly Foxed a very good read, as well as recommending some very readable books. There are also the, the books which one knows one ought to read. We've got a piece coming on Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, all six volumes of it, and it's um, written by a retired professor who lives in Norfolk. And he has done an incredible job of encapsulating in 2,000 words a massive work. And if I'm honest, I am never going to read Gibbon. I just don't have the time. I think a lot of books are sort of what I would call aspirational books. You have very good intentions that at some point or other you will read. So I think some of our articles are there to, to encourage people to try things. We have a very good writer called Christopher Rush who lives in Scotland and he's written about Paradise Lost and about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and even if you don't actually buy the books it gives you a sort of insight into these books which are absolutely part of our sort of literary heritage really. But I find myself, because we were talking about I think it was the letters of Charles and Mary Lamb in a podcast yes. and I, I went away and found all of them and now they're sitting on my coffee table, three fat volumes, old ones from a library somewhere and they are great, I'm never going to read them all but dipping into them, the kind of picture of domesticity of how they lived, those two, in very straightened circumstances, it's so fascinating. I would never have read those. I would never really have thought of reading those if I hadn't read the piece in Fox. Yeah, so that's what we aim for. <laughs> yes, well, it's your fault that I've got a lot more books than I did at the start of uh, <laughs> making this podcast <laughs> with you two. And the pieces aren't uncritical. I mean, going back to the, you know, is it a good book? Is it not? Is it a book you should read? You know, it's about enthusiasm. Yes, I mean, the, the pieces are not, they're not lit crit, basically. It's the enthusiasm and the, and the passion for a particular writer or a particular subject that needs to come through. I, I often find that the re reviews in the national press are so distanced and so objective that, you know, it doesn't necessarily convey the essence of the book in a way that somebody you know can. John Walcott's an example of a, an enthusiast. I mean, his passion... Well, John Walcott, first of all, he, to introduce him, he, he works for Little Toller Press. And in fact, we're having um, a podcast coming up on Little Toller Press as an example of a very successful small independent press. But John Walcott has a passion for romantic ruins and deserted houses. And he suggested a piece to us on a book by John Harris called No Voice from the Hall, which is in the summer issue. 
Harris had a passion for English country houses and, in fact, he helped Roy Strong to organise the important exhibition at the V&A, which helped to prevent the destruction of some of these great houses. And um, No Voice from the Hall is all about pleasure of discovering and exploring these ruins. And it's a lovely piece and, and very personal, which is a hallmark, really, of, of Slightly Foxed. And Hazel, you have got a, a real variety of books in um, in the summer issue, haven't you? I'm, I'm looking down the list of what there is. Yes, there are. We like to include some children's books. And um, this summer there's a piece about a book called The Family from One End Street. I loved that book as a child. It's been criticised as being patronising, but it's right. about um, a dustman's family, the sort of trials and tribulations of their life. We like to include some cookery and food. And we've got a contributor called Clive Unger Hamilton on a book called A Taste of Paris, which is full of recipes for classic French dishes. Clive and his wife actually lived in Paris for quite a long time, and I believe they started the first fish and chip shop in Paris. How did um, that go, I wonder? Uh, well, I believe it was a real <laughs> hit. Um, <laughs> he's done a very funny piece. And gardening, of course. Very and much of the moment, gardening. Very much of the moment. And we've got Ursula Buchan, another of our very regular contributors on the writing of a plant hunter called Reginald Farrar. Yeah, Ursula Buchan, she, she guested for us, didn't she, on a podcast? I think it was last year about garden writing. It is a fantastic listen, isn't it, Gail? If you haven't heard it, she's very funny. It is. It is. And yes, and she's um, botanically trained, but also able to able to write brilliantly. She was a surprise to me. She's such a grand dame of the gardening writing world that I had not expected her to be so subversive and entertaining. <laughs> for a long time, she was the correspondent, gardening correspondent for The Spectator. And there were two collections of her essays, and, and one was called Good in a Bed, and the second one was um, Better Against the Wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a great reading, I think, in that podcast, actually. It's taken from the Slightly Fox archive, and it demonstrates what we've been talking about. It's about a book that is by no means well-known outside gardening circles, but the writer really brings it to life. Let's, let's play in a bit of this. This is Michael Leapman's piece about Christopher Lloyd's book, The Well-Tempered Garden. There is no good reason why an expert gardener should be able to write elegant prose. And a survey of the gardening shows of bookshops will confirm that the two skills rarely converge. One glittering exception was Christopher Lloyd, known familiarly as Christo, who died in 2006, having spent almost his entire adult life developing the five-acre garden at his family home in Great Dixter, East Sussex. Although he was deadly serious about gardening, his writing was always unstuffy, telling us almost as much about him and his acquaintances as about his plants and preferences. He would use the reactions of others to clarify his own ideas. The very first sentence of his best-known book, The Well-Tempered Garden, hints at this. Friends sometimes ask me to deliver post-mortems on their less successful gardening efforts, but it is very difficult to pronounce with any certainty when their case history has been thoroughly masked. This slightly irritable tone, bordering on the... When you get the general sense of, um, of what I'm talking about, it's a really excellent listen. And that, is, that was um, the episode last year, Garden Writing, if you'd like to listen to that podcast. Um, we should mention the reader there, actually. That was Nigel Anthony. Uh, he's a well-known actor. BBC fans of um, uh, Ready for the World Service will know his voice. Fox team are very fortunate to be able to call on a very varied team of readers for the podcast too. Where do they come from, Gail? People you know most of them, aren't they? Yes, exactly. One or two friends who are in that world and do it professionally and some who are actors but who also do, um, do you call them voiceovers? Yeah. And yes, they've brought a whole new dimension to the articles. Uh, but they've been fun to do and I, I must admit watching them doing their recordings is fascinating. Now, tell me where you have got to now. We've been talking about the summer issue, but presumably you're working on the autumn issue. I mean, obviously you're working on the autumn issue. Well, yes, the autumn issue is actually almost in its final proof stage. Um, the articles, you know, they've been edited, checked and double-checked, but we don't necessarily know how many pages they're going to occupy. So they go off to our designer, Andrew, and he puts them into layout so we can see exactly how long each piece is and whether or not there's space for illustrations. And then we, we proofread. And it's not just checking facts, checking spelling and all of that. It's dealing with widows and orphans. And after a lot of checking, we end up with the final version. And Hazel, as Gail says, that's in proof now. Talk me through a few of your favourite bits and pieces out of that one that are coming up. 
Yes, I think a piece I particularly enjoyed is a piece by Rose Baring about a book called A Fortunate Man by John Berger. And it, he followed a country GP in the 50s on his work. And he was a very unusual GP in a way in that he saw his patients as whole people and he felt that their minds were as important as their bodies. I think it starts off with the scene of him rushing to some sort of rural accident. But he had his finger on the horn of the car and he told Berger afterwards that it was not just to clear the way, but it was also to let his patient know that he was coming because it was very, very important for him to know that. Rose herself, she partly runs Elan Press, but she's also trained as a psychotherapist. So she, of course, finds all this very fascinating. And actually, this GP committed suicide in the end. Oh, really? And, I mean, it just seemed very relevant to now, really, because she said that, you know, she couldn't do her work without the emotional support of colleagues. And she's amazed that the people in the NHS get so little of this, really. And I suppose this seems particularly relevant to what's been happening to us. I think that's true, Hazel. You know, you know, my husband's a doctor, work hospital consultant, and in the midst of all this gruesomeness, they, they are unsupported, and they do yes. support each other, as you say. And you can see how they can easily become overwhelmed. Yes, it sounds like a fascinating book. What a sad tale. He just took on too much. Yes, I mean, he he psychoanalyzed himself, which was extremely personally painful. So yes, I found that a fascinating piece. But uh, we've got a piece about two books that we're reissuing, children's books, really, Rosemary Sutcliffe, in the series that we're doing of her Roman novels. We're bringing out two in the autumn, the Frontier Wolf and Lantern Bearers, and got a good piece about them by Sue Gaysford. I mean, Rosemary Sutcliffe is an extraordinary writer, I think. I've been rereading her during lockdown, and she's classed as a children's writer, but really, I think any adult who is interested in, at all in history would, you know, be as gripped by them as I was. They're full of detail. They tell you all about the Roman world of early Britain. And so that, those are a very fascinating books, I find. And you've got um, a Jessica Mitford, is that right? Yes, we're reissuing Ons and Rebels. I've just fi- finished doing a second proofread and the sort of upper class confidence that her generation had, feeling that they could do whatever they wanted. I mean, she was extraordinary. She was brought up in the Cotswolds in a a large family, as everybody knows. I mean, Nancy Mitford was her older sister. Beau Devonshire, as she became, was was the youngest of the family. But Jessica, who's always known as as Decker, became passionately left-wing and her one of the sisters nearest to her in age, Unity, became passionately pro-fascist and, yes. and in fact became a friend of, of Hitler. Was Jessica the one with the running away fund when she was a little girl? Yes, exactly. When she was very young, she started a savings account. And then when she was 18, she met um, a cousin called Esmond Romilly, who was a real rebel. And they met at a house party one weekend and they just recognised kindred spirits and she decided to run away with him to go to Spain, to, to the Civil War. I mean, the deceits that went on, you know, she forged a letter from a friend inviting her to stay with the family in France. And of course, her parents said, yes, of course she could go. And she asked for sort of money for clothes. But in fact, this was all to add to the running away fund. And she cheerfully said goodbye to them at Charing Cross Station. And the next thing they knew, some weeks later, she was in southern France trying to get into Spain. And the family knew the foreign secretary and they they sent a destroyer to try and get her back. Can you imagine? Another era entirely. Yeah, Yeah, but the book is written in the 1960s and she can look back at herself and see just how, in some ways, how how badly behaved she was. I think she must have been quite a difficult character. But anyhow, it is a rather extraordinary story. I'm a huge fan of the Mitford's books, actually. I really love Nancy Mitford's books as well. Her novels are long-term favourites of mine. They're they're absolute bliss, aren't they? Alongside that, we've got a a piece on a, a book called A Night to Remember, which is an account that was published in the mid-50s about the sinking of the Titanic. And and what distinguishes it from, you know, a very large number of books on the subject is that Walter Lord, the author, actually interviewed the survivors and it doesn't try to pass comment. It simply records what happened, including, you know, people who voluntarily gave up their places in boats. And this article arrived out of the blue from a man called David Fleming. Um, And it turns out he was a customs officer. So you could see that it was a subject sort of close to his heart. So, uh, So, yes, you know, lots of variety. Indeed. 
We mentioned a lot, a lot of books there. So um, do, do remember, you can always find every single book that we mention in the show notes attached to the episode. And if you listen on the Slightly Fox website, you can also find them there, foxedquarterly.com. Uh, we're going to move on now to a full-length extract uh, from an archive issue of the Slightly Fox magazine, which has been specially recorded for the podcast. Hazel, tell us what we're going to hear this time and why, why you've chosen it. This is a piece about a book called A Boy at the Hogarth Press by Richard Kennedy. Richard Kennedy arrived at the Hogarth Press, brought there by a happy connection, having failed at school and got no qualifications whatever. And this is his account, written actually many years after he left. In 1922, Richard Kennedy's formidable grandmother pulled a well-connected string and got him a scholarship to Marlborough. To say that Kennedy's education up to this point had been patchy is an understatement. As he describes it in his childhood memoir, A Parcel of Time, it consisted of two uneducated women, his mother and his nurse, failing to teach him to read, followed by a series of pretty dire South Coast prep schools from which he generally absented himself by the simple expedient of taking the bus home. By the time he reached Marlborough, he was, more or less, literate, but a scholar he was not, and everyone knew it. At the age of 16, he found that his presence was no longer required at this august establishment, and he left without a qualification to his name, thus joining that long line of individuals considered dunderheads at school, who later flourish while the clever chaps are forgotten. Before that, however, he was to spend a memorable period as an apprentice to Leonard and Virginia Woolf at the Hogarth Press, and in his wickedly funny account of that time, a boy at the Hogarth Press, he produced a minor classic. Rarely has high art been so candidly observed at close quarters or so beguilingly combined with domestic detail. Richard Kennedy arrived at the press in 1926, all eagerness and enthusiasm, getting a second chance to prove myself, and left three and a half years later, pronounced by Leonard Wolfe to be the most frightful idiot he had ever had the privilege of meeting in a long career of suffering fools. It is clear, however, that a great deal of mutual affection passed between them and indeed between all parties, in the basement world of pinafores and packing cases, proofs pegged up to dry, Eccles cakes and apple turnovers, and the snoring spaniel Pinker, Leonard's constant companion. There was also, of course, Mrs Wolfe, yet to publish her first masterpiece, and to be seen writing in a large, windowless room, surrounded by bales of books, novels, political and psychoanalytical essays, biography, not to mention the Russians, When not writing, she is acting as hand-press compositor, conversing with visitors, Desmond McCarthy, Roger Fry, American publishers, wafting in from a party in some marvellous gown, forever rolling her shag cigarettes. The smoke from these roll-ups is a light motif of this enchanting memoir. The others are Leonard's trembling hands and cries of anguish as some new stupidity is perpetrated. Kennedy's spelling of accept as except, for example in a two-line letter about a manuscript which it takes him two hours to type, and the lunchtime walks with Leonard, accompanied by Pinker, round Tavistock Square, where the great plain trees mark the seasons. On these occasions, Kennedy learned a lot from Leonard, who became something of a father figure. Partly under his tutelage, partly just by soaking up the atmosphere, Kennedy now found himself reading T.S. Eliot, Anatole France, D.H. Lawrence and Proust, this last the cause of some bemusement to Mrs Wolfe, as Kennedy pronounced it to rhyme with Faust. But the boy also endeavoured to make himself useful. He packed books, wrote better letters, put up a shelf. There were numerous shelves for books, but none for the countless leaflets and circulars announcing each new title. Kennedy, endeavouring to put this right, found it a much harder job than I thought, it did not take me long to discover that the damp and rotten walls were not going to give much purchase Eventually, the shelf goes up. Inevitably, it later comes down, in a scene which is a small masterpiece of comic writing. I was given a boy at the Hogarth Press for Christmas some years ago, and it made my day. I lay by the fire on the sofa, and was completely entranced by the world it recreated. For the life of a small publisher is like no other. It's all hands to the pump, in a way which now simply doesn't happen in a vast conglomerate awash with money. In an age where company swallows company and Amazon endeavours to swallow the lot, it is refreshing to think not only of the long-gone activities of the Hogarth Press, but also of the office of Slightly Foxed, 
where jiffy bags are stuffed by everyone as each new title in this series is published, ready to be sent off to loyal subscribers. <laughs> Hazel, that makes me think so much of... We, we have lots of work experience people who come. And do you remember the boy who... I sent off to the post office to collect a parcel for us that had to be signed for and he needed some identification and I very stupidly gave him the credit card and the post office was only about 20 minutes away and two hours later there was no sign of him and eventually I got a phone call from somebody at the Guardian who had found this credit card on the pavement and basically the poor boy had got a hole in his jeans pocket and he'd spent hour after hour scouring the pavements of Clerkenwell for it. That's such a sad tale. No, it does ring lots of bells, doesn't it, Pete? The agonies of the first job. I mean, I'm sure we've all been through it, haven't we? Terrible things we did. Yeah. And that was an extract from a piece by Sue G on Richard Kennedy's A Boy at the Hogarth Press. And thanks to Fiona Hampton for reading it for us. Now, I want to ask Gail and Hazel what they've been reading during lockdown shortly. But first, a word about Slightly Foxed. Elegant, eclectic and entertaining, Slightly Foxed is the literary quarterly for non-conformists. It introduces readers to all those wonderful books that languish on publishers' backlists but are often very hard to find in bookshops. Among its contributors are distinguished writers and novelists and people from other walks of life, all of whom share their passion for particular books and authors and write about them beautifully. Now, since it's entirely independent, Slightly Foxed is free to follow its own nose and celebrate the offbeat. So why not take out a subscription? £48 for an annual print subscription in the UK and Ireland and £56 overseas. Your subscription also includes free access to all the back issues in the digital archive. Here's the web address, foxedquarterly.com, or if you'd rather talk to a human, give the office a ring on 020 7033 0258. Thank you. Now, this is the point where I usually ask our guests for uh, their recommended reads. So why don't you two tell everyone what you've been reading during lockdown? A book I've enjoyed very much, actually, was a rather new biography by Hadley Freeman. It's an autobiography, actually, in a way. It's about her own family. Hadley Freeman is um, a columnist on The Guardian. She comes from a family who originated in Poland, a Jewish family. They left Poland after the terrible pogroms that occurred at the end of the First World War and settled in Paris. There were three brothers and a sister, and the sister was Hadley Freeman's grandmother. They were all extraordinarily happy in Paris until the Second World War came along. One of them became a rather flamboyant couturier. One of them was a very gifted engineer. But Hadley's grandmother, Sala, when war broke out and the Nazis were advancing on Paris, there was panic among the Jewish community, obviously, and her couturier brother brought an American friend to see them and he totally fell in love with Sala and pressured her to go back to America with him. Meantime, Sala had met somebody she'd fallen in love with in Paris, but under pressure from her family, really, and especially from her brother Alex, she agreed to actually go to America to marry this man called Bill, with the understanding, of course, that the family would be able to follow. She was told that he was something very big in design, When she got there, she found he actually lived in a small town called Farmington on Long Island, and he kept a petrol station. Oh, no. So Hadley had always wondered why her grandmother had always seemed sad. And she didn't know this story. Her grandmother never spoke of it. But after her grandmother's death, she found a shoebox with correspondence. And it turned out that Sala had actually given up her life, really, to go to America and make a marriage that wasn't a terribly happy one. She did return to Paris after having two children. She used to take them with them and go and visit the family after the war. I mean, it's a story of a Jewish family, and there have been many of those. But this was a, a not a particularly... They weren't Rothschilds or anyone yeah. famous, but the story of how they all survived in their different ways is, is very touching, and yeah. I really recommend it. It's very well written. Gail? Coincidentally, I've been reading a wonderful novel, also set partly during the Second World War, very complicated book to describe, really. It's called All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Durr, published in 2014, and it won the Pulitzer Prize. It's the tale of two individuals. It starts in 1934 with Werner Fennig, who is a young boy living in Germany. He's an orphan. He is very clever making radios. In fact, he, he works out how to build his own radio. And 
he and his sister spend evenings listening and they pick up across the airwaves a man reading essays about the nature of light. Sometimes they manage to pick him up and sometimes they don't. But he becomes entranced by this. And at the same time in Paris, um, there's a young girl called Marie-Laure Leblanc, who is the daughter of a locksmith who works at the Natural History Museum. She is going blind, and because her father knows that she's going to be blind, he has created a model of their neighbourhood in Paris so that she can physically feel her way down streets and alleyways. And the story follows these two characters as The Rise of Hitler Werner is, first of all, forced into the Hitler Youth and then joins the army as a radio operator. And his job is to try and capture resistance members. Marie Law, meanwhile, her father and she have fled Paris and her father's taken with him a diamond, which is, it's not the Koh-i-Noor, but it has the same sort of history and, and myth wrapped around it. And he's concealed it in a model house. And they, they end up, in the end, in, in Saint-Malo. Meanwhile, Werner is sent to France. And in a rather magical way, he and Marie-Law meet and they spend a day together. And I, I'm not going to say any more because it will spoil the story, but it's an entrancing book, a whole world you can lose yourself in. I cannot recommend it enough. Sounds wonderful. Um, right, well, I think we're going to bring this to a close now. Uh, do visit the Slightly Fox website to subscribe to the Quarterly magazine or browse through the books you'll find for sale there, foxquarterly.com. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please do review and rate us on, on whichever app you use to listen. The more ratings we get, the more listeners we reach. We'll be back on July 15th with one of our Sense of Place episodes, and this time it's about the Arab world with the travel writer and historian Justin Marozzi. Thank you, as always, for listening and for joining us on this month's literary expedition, Off the Beaten Track.